I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God in Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah To proceed, my dearest brothers and sisters in humanity, peace be with you Today I'm going to be talking about a miracle of the Qur'an It's a very special miracle And it is the linguistic and literary miracle of the Qur'anic discourse Now, before I get into that, I really want to discuss what do we mean by a miracle because traditionally in Western philosophy, if we read the likes of David Hume, he actually talked about a miracle in the following way and he said it is a breaking of a natural law. And he actually had a contention to this because he said, look, natural laws are what? They're just patterns that we perceive in the universe. There are inductive generalizations of patterns we perceive in the universe. We take a particular set of pattern or of the pattern, we assume it's always going to be the same. And therefore, if something breaks that pattern, does it really mean it's a miracle? No, it doesn't. It's very incoherent, isn't it? Because maybe it's an exception to the pattern or we haven't been looking hard enough. So the point is, it's an incoherent perspective of what miracles are. I think from the Islamic philosophical perspective, the following definition of a miracle is far more coherent. Now, in Islam, we describe a miracle as an act of impossibility. Now, what we mean by impossibility is not in formal logic. What we mean is that we can't find a natural explanation when we exhaust all natural explanations for a particular event. Let me give an example. The Quran talks about Moses, Musa, alayhi salam, upon whom be peace. And this is similar to the other traditions like Christianity that Moses spoke to the Pharaoh and in the Quranic narrative Moses threw down his staff he was told to throw down a, a wooden staff and it turned into a snake and it ate other snakes the illusory products of the magicians at that time now interestingly this is actually a miracle because it's an act of impossibility it has nothing to do with breaking natural law per se it's more of we can't actually explain it in a natural way because you take a wooden staff and no, ma no matter what you do to the wooden staff which is an inanimate object it will never become animated like a snake it is impossible no matter what we do with the natural environment or the natural thing which we now call the staff if we cut it slice it put lemon on it whatever the case we may be whatever we do it will never turn into a snake ever if we exhaust all possibilities it will never turn into a snake so this is an act of impossibility. We can't find a natural explanation. So it's a sign to the divine. It's a sign to the supernatural. This is a far more coherent way of looking at miracles. So the Quran is a linguistic miracle. Now why am I saying this? Because the Quran is an act of impossibility. Because when we go to the finite letters in the Arabic language, 28 letters in the Arabic language, the finite classical words, the finite grammatical rules, we exhaust all combinations, we cannot produce the unique literary form of the Qur'an. We can't. Now this whole argument actually stems from the Qur'an itself. For example, in Surah Baqarah, chapter Baqarah, chapter the cow, which is the second chapter, in the 23rd verse, the Qur'an says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِرَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأَتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدُعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Which basically says, and if you're in doubt about this book which we have sent down to our Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, then bring one chapter like it and call on your supporters and your witnesses and anybody else besides God if you are truthful in your claim. This is an intellectual challenge. And we know this challenge came in a certain environment. It came in an environment where in the 7th century Arabia, the Arabs were the best at expressing themselves in Arabic tongue. So it was a linguistic challenge at the time. This is why the various scholars, Eastern and Western scholars, appreciate that this is a linguistic and literary challenge to the best people who could express themselves in the Arabic tongue. And we know this historically, the famous Arab historian Ibn Rashid. He states that that essentially at the time of Arabia in the 7th century, they would only celebrate on two things, the birth of a boy and when a poet rose amongst them because there was a socialization that the expression of language, the classical Arabic was like, you know, you're like a president or you're like a, one of the top guys in society. 
So the Quran came to challenge the people who are best placed to try to try to even bring that challenge because it was an environment where scholars call them Arabic linguists par excellence, the best. So the Quran came to challenge them and these people failed. We know this because even the best linguist of the time, his name was Walid ibn al mughira he said, by God, this cannot come from a human being. I know the sciences of the language. This can't come from a human being. Now, what is it that makes the Quran unique from this perspective? Now, there's no point going into too much detail because many of you probably don't even speak Arabic. But to talk about this, we could basically say in a very basic way that the Quran de-scopes the Arabic language because generally in the Arabic language there are certain literary forms. We have saj, saja, which is rhyme prose. We have mursal, which is straightforward speech. We have poetry, which has 16 rhythmical patterns based upon the length of syllables, which are called the al-bihar. And we have a style called maqama. Maqama is a combination of prose and poetry. But the Quran descopes any of these. It descopes them. Because the Quran is not poetry. You can't take any chapter and the totality of each chapter corresponding to any of the al-bihar, the rhythmical patterns of poetry. We know it's not maqama because in maqama there is a distinct difference between its use of prose and poetry. It doesn't intermingle. Whereas the Quran has this unique intermingling. If we read the works of Professor A.J. Arbery, he said the Quran is a unique fusion of prose and poetry. Also, we know it's not straightforward speech because the Qur'an is full of embellishments, full of rhetoric and eloquence and rhythm. And also we know it's not saja, it's not rhyme prose because rhyme prose is, is quite defined. If we read the works of Devin J. Stewart, the Arabist and the scholar, he writes in the Encyclopedia of the Qur'an and in other places that rhyme prose is defined by having an end rhyme, by having an accent-based rhythmical pattern, the pattern is based on the stress just like nursery rhymes, ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? That's an accent based with Mikul pattern rather than it based on the syllable. And also, the definition of rhyme prose has a concentrated use of rhetorical devices. Now, the Quran transcends this because it has far more rhetorical devices than any other known form of rhyme prose. And it descopes structurally various features of rhyme prose. So it's a unique. It's a unique piece of literature, it's a unique literary form. This is why we have the likes of Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book, The Quran, a biography on page number eight. He says, Quranic verses as tangible signs are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. We have Professor Martin Zamet from the Netherlands. He said, notwithstanding pre-Islamic poetry, the Quran is the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. We have Professor Neil Robinson in his book, it's an amazing book, Discovering the Quran, a contemporary approach to a vote text. He has a whole chapter concerning the dynamic style of the Quran, which in the Arabic tradition is called iltifat, which is this referencing shifting in the Quranic discourse that it, it far transcends any other known Arabic discourse. And we have Reverend R. Bosfa Smith in his book Muhammad and Muhammadanism. He said, the Quran is a miracle of purity of style and of wisdom and of truth. So the point here is that there is almost a valid authentic testimony coming from people who have the tools to assess the Quranic Arabic. So it must be a miracle because the best people who knew how to speak and articulate themselves in the best possible way in the Arabic language failed to challenge the Quran. So it's an act of impossibility. Because it's, it's not only a unique literary form, but no one has been able to challenge and replicate this unique literary form. So when we go to the nature of the Arabic of the Quran, which is the Arabic language, and we exhaust all possibilities, we can never create the unique literary form of the Quran, which makes it an act of impossibility. We can't find a naturalistic explanation. Therefore, it's assigned to the divine by definition. So it's a linguistic and literary miracle. Now one contention is this, what about Shakespeare? Shakespeare was amazing, he had a unique style. So it doesn't mean Shakespeare's divine or has revelation. I agree, but Shakespeare has nothing to do with the unique literary form. We're talking about the structural features of language, rhyme, rhythm, the structural features. 
We're not talking about aesthetic reception, the use of the language in this particular way. Because Shakespeare wasn't unique concerning form, because he was known to use the iambic pentameter, which was used by many other English scholars. He used trochaic verse and blank verse used by Christopher Marlowe and many, many other English literators. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a false contention. The Qur'an has a unique literary form. So from this perspective, philosophically, we know it is a miracle. So, what does it mean? It actually means if it's a miracle, it's from the divine. If it's from the divine, then what the Qur'an says is going to be true. Because what comes from truth is true. It's like an epistemic foundationalism, which basically means that you have truth claims about foundational truths. And what is built on these truths is going to be true. So when the Quran says pray five times a day, it's good for you and it's going to make you come closer to God, then that's true. If the Quran says that we must prohibit interest in our economic model because it's an impediment to the distribution of wealth, then we should do so because it's true. Don't get me wrong, we could assess these rationally as well. But this is the easiest way. It came from God, then it's going to be true. Thank you very much for listening.